My name is Craig, I'm associate professor of meteorology at San Jose State University, and my research is on fire weather. And uh, my lab is our research laboratory. We sell we donate in the proceeds, agencies and stuff, and students and agencies, and so plugging us here. What I want to talk about today is basic weather, fire weather impacts. And one thing I wanted to point out for those of you is that I'm building a curriculum base for fire weather and wildfire science to put into. Originally it was 6th grade through 8th grade, but I got such good feedback on Tuesday that I said we really need to do high school, so I'm going to try to adopt that back up to high school. And uh, what I'll talk about at the end of the talk will be about this one day workshop that we're doing at San Jose State on wildfire science. So today I'll talk about fire weather, fire behavior basics kind of at a low level, this is actually firefighter training, but this would be high school level uh, science. And then I'll talk about our research, really state of the science research in wildfires and bring it to California because we've got lots of stuff going on. So my goals, my research goals are to uh, better understand how the atmosphere influences wildfire behavior and how wildfires create their own weather. And that's kind of the goal of this five-year NSF grant that I have. And one issue that you can imagine is measuring the atmosphere or meteorological measurements you know, up in the mountains and Tahoe is pretty easy, but trying to get those measurements, let's say, around the fire is very difficult. So that's kind of my goal in our uh, game is to go to fires and with state of the science instrumentation and basically pro wildfires. And I'll show you results of that. Okay, so what is fire weather? Well, it's California weather, really. It's hot, dry, and windy. And so when we think of severe weather in the U.S., and as a meteorologist, I have to always uh, tell students, especially in California, like San Jose State, they're bored with their weather, right? It's perfect. This is like paradise. It's what the rent is like. Everybody loves it here. You can go to Oklahoma, but then you have to worry about tornadoes. And I lived in Houston, I did my doctorate in Houston. I grew up in the Bay Area, and I remember in grad school, before I moved to Houston, I did my whole background, I did my bachelor's at the University of Nevada, Reno. I started in the Bay Area at uh, Diablo Valley College, and I went to the University of Utah for my master's, started my PhD in Canada, and then finished my PhD at the University of Houston. And going from, like, the West to Houston, big change. I mean, it's hot and muggy, and I worked outside, it's just amazing. You get used to it. So, it's not hot, dry, and windy there. Uh, the uh, AMS glossary, which is the American Geological Society's kind of standard glossary for terms, is uh, weather variables, including wind, temperature, relative humidity, and precipitation that influence fire start or, or ignition, fire behavior, and fire suppression. Okay, so just general terminology. So you've seen these signs Smokey says, fire danger is high, extreme. This is actually, this little sign that the park rangers put up is actually numerically calculated every hour for the United States. And so there's a network of weather stations around the country, and it's called the Remote Automated Weather Station. And so they basically collect weather data, and then every hour they send that data to a satellite. It goes to a national center, which is called the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, Idaho. And that data then gets distributed and calculated for different regions. And so a danger, a fire danger rating is produced like everywhere. And it depends on the uh, horizontal scale, but it's usually by county or by region. And so that's where this sign comes from. Even though this is like a little piece of cardboard or plywood, it's calculated every day. And I think it's hourly now. So let's look at some fire weather conditions. This plot's pretty boring, but this is actually the Rottos weather station from the Valley Fire, which there's lots of media going on about that fire, and it's simply not what you read in the press. It's actually fire weather. It's not epic climate. This was, this is the time of ignition here. What I want to point out, and this laser is not perfect. You can barely see it, but wind speed is the solid line here. So up to 40 miles an hour. The dash line is the wind gusts, and then the 
dots are the hourly average for wind direction. <coughs> Temperature is a solid line here, degrees Fahrenheit, and then this is relative humidity. And so we know that relative humidity affects fire danger because what happens is there's different fuel classes. And the fuel classes go as one hour fuels, which is your grass. So you know all the golden grass in California, all the beautiful golden hills? Well, that is a dry grass. Right? It's cured, fully cured. So you react, it reacts instantly, or actually within one hour, to the, world, to the relative humidity that surrounds it. So we call it one hour fuels. The next fuel, which oh, I forgot to bring the darn fuel stick again. Okay, a fuel stick, it's like the thickness of your thumb, it's about this long, it's a ponderosa pine dowel. And inside of it, you know, a piece of metal, and you get the water uh, motion contact, the conductivity through it. And that's connected to a weather station. And that's a 10 hour fuel stick. Then it goes to 100 hour fuels and 1,000 hour fuels. And 1,000 hour fuels are big pieces of wood. So the drought does not affect the 1 hour fuels. It doesn't really affect the 10 hour fuels, right? It affects the 1,000 hour fuels. And so that's why our forests are burning so hot. Because we are in a drought. But if you don't have the wind, if you don't have somebody igniting the fire at first, then you won't have a wildfire problem. But if you don't have the wind, you won't have like this epic spread that occurred on, on uh, Saturday of last week, where 400 homes were destroyed in the Middletown area. So here's the ignition, and what you see, I'm going to use the laser pointer. So the winds were about 10 miles an hour, gusting to like 25. So this is the day before, the 10th, the, two days before, the 11th. So this is kind of your basic sea breeze. But on this day, where the ignition happened about 1 p.m. here, humidity was about 13%. It's pretty low humidity. Especially for coastal California. And then the temperature was about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, so it wasn't spectacularly warm. And But if you look at the winds, they started picking up right there. And they're northwesterly. Here's the wind direction here. So they're 270 degrees, so they're actually westerly. And what happens is the big westerly surge of wind moves through at the same time as the ignition. And so there was no chance that you know, the timing of that is just perfect. Once the ignition occurred, which is, I think, right, let's see, it's just lined up, eh, close enough, this is one. Yeah, so the ignition is like right on the inside of the pink shaped box. Winds were at 15, gusting to 25. They picked up to 25 for hourly average, or actually, the 10 average on the hour, and gusting to almost 36 miles an hour, and dead west. So this was a wind driven fire, that's what we call it, a wind driven event. And although the media has blown it out of proportion, the, you know, this spread rate was 40,000 acres overnight in a day. The King Fire burned 50,000 overnight. So, last summer. Yeah? What did I don't know. I think it's still under investigation. I haven't seen any reports yet. So, yeah? The latest is, I think, PG&E, my uh, power line. Oh, I heard that was for the uh, rough fire. Is that what they're saying for this fire, too? Yeah, yeah I know the meteorological stuff, pg &E. Mm -hmm. Actually, T is temperature and R is Yeah, it's relative humidity. Yeah, so this is a time series of data, and you can this you download you can download this off the web. This is great for students. You download this much, this data, and you can plot it in Excel. It's actually it comes in Excel or common illuminated, and you can actually analyze weather conditions pretty easily. And this is for any weather station actually in the United States. You can get this data up to the nearest five. So if you're doing just now that I know kind of after Tuesday night what's going on here, if you know if you're doing any kind of weather type of uh, section in your class, you can get data really easily and download it and just have website. It's okay, so let me write down. Meso West. Google. I can choose Google. Meso West. It's actually at the University of Utah. That's right from the master, so I know when they basically take every weather station, even people that have home weather stations, and they do QA, QC, and that data is like research quality. I mean, you can, you can plot it up really fancy. My grad student did this with Python, or you can just use Excel. It's just as, just as fast. So you can just Google Meso OS, it'll take you to the University of Utah link, you can map the US, pick the state, and then you have to select National Weather Service. There's you do National Weather Service, is only about probably 50 stations in the state. If you do all, hundreds. And there's still gaps. There's actually a gap in Middletown, believe it or not. This is actually Kelseyville. So it's a couple of ridge lines over. Middletown has no weather station. Like that whole area where 
returning this summer. South Lake, South Lake Clear Lake is just <coughs> a data void. Okay, I went off on tangent here. Okay, so what drives fire behavior? I, I personally think that this kind of stuff is really interesting, especially for students. So this is the fire behavior triangle. We call it the fire environment triangles. I'm more focused on the weather effects. But if you're a fire behavior analyst, every wildfire incident has an incident meteorologist from the National Weather Service. And then they're coupled or paired with the F band, or fire behavior panels. And so somebody who actually makes forecasts where the fire's going to go. And when we go to wildfires, we actually team up with both those um, crew members. And what goes into fire behavior is the weather, obviously. Like the last fire I just showed you, the example of the fire. Fuels, one hour, 10 hour, 100 hour, and the topography. And in California, like the rough fire in outside of Jackson, it's really steep terrain, big timber, so it's fuels and topography, and then they had the wind, so that fire was, was a big fire as well. Two large fires going on in Northern California. And we haven't gotten into the uh, Santa Ana season in Southern California yet, so fire season really hasn't gotten big yet, even though it's a lot of acres of it. Okay, fire experiments. This is something that I do, and this is my key picture of my PhD work. That's a 150 foot research tower. And what we do is we burn the grass right underneath and through it. And we can measure all sorts of properties on these towers. So turbulence, wind speed, temperature, radiation, all these different things. But, so these are fires that are set purposely to study them. And this is something that we do with the Forest Service. Cal Fire sometimes accommodates our, we, we basically piggyback on what they call or what we call prescribed fires. Prescribed fire is set by land managers. And this is a problem because, like in California, we don't do a lot of prescribed fire. In the southeastern U.S., we do a lot of prescribed fire because they have lots of paper, forests for paper. And they just grow trees like mad and cut them down for own, but they have to maintain them and they use fire. Because that ecosystem down like Florida, right? Lightning, thunderstorms, so they have a lot of fire. We, the U.S. Forest Service, basically suppressed wildfire. Uh, Ignitions for many, many years is, of course, a little of fuel, so it's one of the nice problems that we're having now. Okay, so that's prescribed fire, which differs from a wildfire, which is a fire that needs control. And then something that you're hearing a lot in the, in the media, there's lots of definitions, I'll just pick a few, is spotting. So especially these fires, these wind driven fires, the reason why they're spreading so fast is because they're spotting. And that means that the plume is brought up burning embers, and then the wind blows it, and it falls down, and it starts. Even though the fire is over here, half a mile to a mile let down wind, it starts. And it just keeps spotting. So it's just crazy. And we know nothing about spotting. That's just a big research team, a big research call right now for these agencies is looking at experiments of spotting and numerical modeling. How do you model a piece of bark that gets lofted by a tree? I mean, it's very random based turbulence and it's complex. So again, primary factors that affect the rate of spread of wildfires, wind speed, steepness of slope, and changes in fuel type. So here's a picture of a kind of an idealized fire. It's got this like parabolic shape, which is very standard. This is what we see in nature and I'll show you some examples. Ignition here, head fire. So the wind is moving or blowing the fire downwind, all downwind called the side fire flanks. And usually uh, fire personnel, uh, they try to attack and suppress fires in the flanks. You can't really get in front of the fire unless it's a, a grass fire. And grass fires have very uh, tall flame fronts. And grass fires actually kill more firefighters than uh, forest fires because they move so fast. And this includes like Australia, which are called brush fires, or bush fires, excuse me. This is a, the rear, it backs very slowly. And when you do prescribe fire, you're usually setting an ignition line here. No, sorry, you'd be setting an ignition line here and letting it back into the fuels. So it's very under control. It's well under control, generally. What's the XRC? This is time. So basically, and it's kind of off because this is the ignition, it should be right here. What it's showing is that in three hours, fire will burn four times, three times three acres, three six acres, so you calculate this area. It's, but basically it takes a little bit of time to go this way, even though that's off. 
but it's much faster and burns more downwind. And the higher, the, the faster the wind, the, the more narrow the shape of the fire. Okay, so here's a model simulation of my colleagues in France. This is the French uh, coupled fire weather model, state of the science, Europe's top fire weather model. So what we're doing now is we're taking these combustion codes and then we're linking them with a the, the weather model. And this is my experiment in Texas with the tower. So those little blocks are the big tall tower I showed. And then these arrows are wind speeds at the surface. And you've seen as you've seen winds accelerate at the fire front. The smoke is a tracer, it's also indicated turbulence, and then you'll see streamlines, which I have to worry about. If you go down with their turbulent streamlines. And then when it flips around, you see this panel, and that's this scale here, which is vertical wind speed. So updrafts and downdrafts. And what you see is these numerical, uh, well, you see these gravity waves, or these, these like little, uh, these waves in the field there. So you're getting like, the heat is punching up into the atmosphere if the atmosphere is somewhat stable and it sets off some sort of gravity wave. But this is the state of the science numerical modeling. This runs on a supercomputer somewhere in Europe, probably a thousand processors, four core kind of thing, and you can't do this on a wildfire. It's never going to happen. And so the idea is to get models to be at higher resolution, but very fast so you can run them on an iPhone. Yeah, so there you can you can download a, the, what's called it's called the eight plus. It's a, it's a standard. You know, it's based off of wind tunnel studies from the '60s, and it's what firefighters are using now, and it works. But it doesn't take any account of fuel density and the, what it takes in the wind, but it doesn't take in the dynamic because it's coupled. How, so how do the firefighters use it? So just uh... Well, they will predict. So basically, they'll use it like this. They'll say, oh, we've got an ignition here. They have GIS. Everybody heard of GIS, right? So then they have the terrain map, and they go to the ignitions here. They have the fuel map, because that's been met for the state and for the forest. And they know the wind, because they probably picked it off a weather station somewhere, and they let it run. So that's how they do it. they input that into their app? Yeah, they would use it on it. There's different apps, but that app basically gives them a spread rate, and then it's applied over the terrain. And so it's very complicated. It's, it's still not good enough, so there's those of us in the community like, eh, we got to do something better, and that's something like this. But this takes many, many hours to process to get the result. And that's only like 75 acres. So we went back in 2013 to do the same experiment. And so I'm just going to skip through some of this. That's a numerical simulation of another model. So we moved our tower array. Uh, just kind of show you we have all sorts of equipment. Look at all this because of time. And this is something called the Doppler LiDAR, which I'll describe in a little more detail. It's like a radar, but it uses a laser beam. So we can measure winds through the fire, or near the fire. Uh, here's a tower. Uh, that's one of my research, my graduate students. So this is a 150 foot tower. And we instrument it with all sorts of instrumentation. You can see the, uh, these things measure turbulence and such. And so we wrap the base of the tower up with this foil material. And that foil material is the same material that firefighters use. It's called a um, fire shelter. In case there is a problem, firefighters can get into the fire shelter. And it doesn't always work. And in the Yardell fire, that whole group were in their shelters when 19 firefighters killed. Okay, so this is a view of using some cameras. Uh, is it just, so it's just a heat factor? That's why it doesn't always work? It's just yeah, it, it, it's like a tinfoil bag. It basically protects you from radiation. Mm -hmm. But if the flame heat front actually impinges on you, you're active that's in, for a long period. And some of the fires are just too, too intense. Okay, so this is looking down at that fire moving through that the tower array and then the fireways. These are cameras that are in here, little video cameras and sensor packages. And it's a very fast moving fire. This was actually considered called a red flag warning, which means burn ban. And the media was all over this. They were trying to shut us down. But it's a University of Houston research center, so you know, they can still shut it down, but somehow the burn boss from the Texas Forest Service, and hopefully what I said helped. But they had a lot of firefighters on this, and we got this burn off, and it's one of the only views of a, a head fire, which is moving very quickly. 
So this is the kind of stuff that we're looking at. We also had a helicopter in the air, and we had some IR video as well. So we're using all that to piece together the fire shape and the fire behavior and propagations. And then when we do the model, model simulations, we can match them up. So this is truth, and then the models are tested against the truth. But interpreting some of the data is not trivial. And I'll show you. So we can measure the temperature on the tower. The hottest temperature is about 300 degrees, 350 degrees. We remain very close to the fire front. That's ignition temperature. So there's lots of theories right now. We're not wildfire science. How does fire spread? Is it radiation? Or is it convection? Or is it conduction? So there's groups that can still argue about that. Yeah? Can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Because sometimes, uh, oh. Sometimes the, the fire they get caught on the uh, burn, already burn and things out of the state. Yeah. And then when the fire comes back to them, a lot, well, actually, I think the majority of them, you know, get trapped in that. Well, what yeah. happens is it depends on the fuels. What, right. what happens if the fire moves through a forest, let's say, it may not burn the canopy of the top of the forest, but it's burned everything underneath. Right. And then if the wind shifts, it can then burn the canopy and then. So, so if you already have the fuel map, down. You know this fire has been gone through at what temperature. Will you be able to calculate whatever that fuel is left there? We so do calculate the fuel left. Okay. You're right. So what we do with this, you can you can get the heat that it took to consume all that fuel. Mm -hmm. These grass fuels are really they're easy because they basically burn to the ground, so it's almost it's like hundred percent consumption. And so that's more of fire ecology, but that's how a lot of Way, that's one way of calculating how much heat went into the atmosphere or into the uh, resulting in fire and affects the vegetation. One big issue for prescribed fire and fire research that came out of ecology because fires would scorch the trees. How hot did it have to be to kill the tree? Is the tree are the trees going to survive? Those kinds of things. And this summer we're getting stand replacement fires, which means like the whole canopy, the whole tree is destroyed. There's nothing we can do. It's just going to grow back as brush or something that shouldn't be there. This is just a picture of looking at the wind from the measure of the tower for every second and then the pressure drop associated with that. And we don't know much about why things occur, but our hypothesis is that winds accelerate the fire front due to a pressure that drop that sets up a low pressure field because it's hot, gas is rising, so you have low pressure, but that moves downstream with, with the wind. And so we're trying to map out the spatial distribution of that. Okay, so that's kind of the experimental side of what we do is we set up these towers, we take all this instrumentation and such, but the cool stuff that we are doing now is actually moving, taking our equipment onto actual wildfires. And so the last, and this, let me show you just a couple of these pictures. These are all from California. And I learned the bald fire from last summer. It's a sunny fire in central California. And this truck, which was also funded by the National Science Foundation, is uh, shared with San Francisco State. So we call it the CSU Maps. It's a mobile profiling system, but it has a weather balloon system, a Doppler LiDAR, which is like a radar, which is a laser beam that I mentioned, and a profiler, which I won't get into. But we can send this data in real time to our website, fireweather.org. Yeah? I'm just curious, the amount of heat produced from the fire, does that have to do with what starts the fire at all? You know, by the time the ignition, the ignition once it, I mean, it burns these fuels, so we can ignite the grass and it's, you don't even know. Mm -hmm. Now it's funny that uh, if where you can sometimes see, you can see where the ignition is. Mm -hmm. So the people that do the... Um, the arson or... Yeah, they determine the ignition, the uh, fire investigators. They can see the fire pattern. But these are years of experience. But if using certain types of chemicals to have started the fire, would that influence um, how much, how it is going to spread? And, and That's a great question. Uh, no, because once you burn, let's say you have chemicals as an ignition source, mm -hmm. and once you burn that ignition source up, it's gone. But it's caught the fuel on fire, and then it's transferring through fuel, fuel element to fuel element to fuel element. All right. So how we start these fires is we use a gasoline diesel mixture and we drip it either from a helicopter or from a, a drip torch, and we walk it. 
Quick question. Yeah. On the Doppler LiDAR, um, I assume you, that you can only really reflect that off of smoke, so you can't really get wind that doesn't contain smoke speed? You can, because there's enough aerosol near the surface, uh, in the boundary layer here, which we consider like the lowest kilometer of, above the surface is the atmospheric boundary layer. So there's usually a lot of aerosol. In Bay Area, it's kind of hard because we operate this on the roof of San Jose State, and because the sea breeze comes in, that's aerosol laden, but it's actually pretty clean. And so we only get very shallow profiles, and it's not until we have a big uh, episode of the pollution, or a big uh, pollution episode in the Bay Area where we get deeper aerosol layers. But you're right, it only works when there's aerosol in the atmosphere. Enough particulate matter to yeah. reflect. And fires are great, and I'll show you some examples. So, and here's how it works. So this would be, it's got like 18 meter resolution. These are about $300,000. And they're pretty fragile. But we have it on our airframe in the back of the truck and they're not that fragile. Actually driving it around, all around. And then, no problem. Putting it in a shipping container and having it insured for $100,000 is when it breaks. <laughs> and, you know, they just, lost, I mean, it's just like, nope, not our fault. They lost the waiver. $40,000 I had to, like, move from student funding to pay for it. So it's just crazy. But anyways, they're, they're robust until they get dropped by a shipping company. See, I'm bitter. Yeah. <laughs> you know it's dropped because it broke the case from the inside out. The handles broke it that way and broke it down because there's no way to do that. Okay. So, this gives you, here's the aerosol layer. So, the, the colors change the, the density of the aerosol, so a little bit more, it's a little dirtier here, a little less dirty. It's cleaner down here, cleaner above. But we would consider this the atmospheric boundary layer. I think this might be from San Jose, I don't know where this is taken. But at the same time, that laser is going up and it's coming back down. We can measure the velocity along the laser path. And so we call that the uh, radial velocity. So reds are updrafts, blues are downdrafts. Mm -hmm. So we can see like a lot of updrafts here. So maybe there's more aerosol being transported up from the surface or something. I don't know how to interpret that really. But this is the free atmosphere, and this is where these eddies come up, and then they sink back down, they rise, they come back down. And so that's just the typical surface of the Earth anyway, basically. So what we try to do is we go to fires and we point the thing at the fire and scan it. And so here's an example of a column. It's converging. Air is flowing into the base of the fire. And what happened here is the thing started rotating. And what's really cool is that you can see this smoke from over here being entrained, sucked into this thing. And so we were able to scan the slice right through it, just like in the tornado chasers here. And here's the, here's the slide. So winds are blowing away, winds are blowing towards, so that's the different colors. And it's about, a, let's see, 14 meters per second, about 14 meters per second coming in. So it's a pretty strong wind. It's not, it's not tornadic <coughs> in nature, but it tracks. And so this is the terrain, those dots on top of the topographic map to show the terrain height, the ridge crest, but the blues and the reds are where that structure or that circulation occurred, you can see it kind of rotate there. So this is like data that we never thought we'd be able to capture. If you look here, you can see where the darker particles are, the thicker, more dense particles exist. Clean air being trained in like that. So we can really capture the flow structure of the fire. So this is a pretty cool example. So here in the Bay Area, in Northern California, we have a temperature inversion. Right, you're familiar with the sea breeze and the marine layer that you hear on the news. So it's cold air from the ocean, and it sits over the Bay Area, or it flows in. Okay. Well, that's indicated by the aerosol being trapped right here. So that's like smoke or haze. It's really smoking here. But what you'll see is you'll see this uh, plume punch through. This is above ground, so let's say 500 meters. It'll punch up to about 4,000 meters above the ground. Okay, let's just play that real quick. So these are scans going vertical like this, big slice. And then you see it detrain, we'll call it detrain, and then it's spreading out on top of that inversion layer. So these kind of structures we just really didn't know existed. And this is the first time this has been measured, actually. This is the LiDAR data? Yeah, this is the LiDAR data. And that's the backscatter intensity. 
So if we, we take in and show you some averages, basically this is a temperature profile, and so you can see that the aerosol comes out with this stable layer here, this is a temperature inversion, and another temperature inversion here, and it's strong wind shear. Wind shear is when the winds do opposite direction. Okay. So we're, these are the kind of things that we can measure. And we can find this wind shear in, um, we can measure the wind shear on a fire, and it actually is a danger situation for firefighters. So it's pretty important to be able to detect these things. Uh, same thing, this one's in Yosemite. These are my students taking pictures. You can see this big plume here. This is the El Portal fire from last summer. And look at the detail of the LIDAR. So that's smoke concentration. I mean, it looks like a movie camera almost, but that's actually quantifiable data. We've got the flow of structures. What's the scale on the right? Yeah, so that is the, um, that is the, uh, that's actually going to lock down. This is the velocity, oh, but that's, no, this is wrong. Oh, meters per square inch. So this is just the uh, backscatter intensity. Sorry, you got me there too. So that's just the backscatter intensity values. So the darker shading is more particle density, lighter shading is cleaner air. And then here it's the velocity field here. So you can see winds, the reds are going away from the lighter, the lighter is like out here somewhere. And this is the scan, sector scan. And what data provides the, the terrain elevation across the bottom? Yeah, so this is the terrain here. This is kind of where you get that information. Uh, actually, GIS or DM files from, I don't know, I didn't want to see where you get it. Usually we get it from some archive of digital train maps and then import it. This is created in MATLAB, so there's a lot of data processing through for this LiDAR data. It doesn't look like this out of the, it's just a bunch of numbers and you gotta interpret it. But you put it to shade. So standard velocity, uh, that's a backscatter. And so winds are going like this. And what you're seeing is winds going like that because it's not actually an updraft, because the LiDAR is only measuring along the beam. So, but we do see that there's an updraft here because it's, you know, it's not perfectly vertical. So this is the kind of stuff that we're measuring. I'm almost done here. Uh, we can take a, a snapshot and look at the velocity field. So again, reds are away, blues are towards. And so what you see is you see a circulation like that, like that like that, and that corresponds with these little turrets, or ring vortices, like this. So as this plume is moving through the atmosphere, it's been trained by shear, the ambient air. Right, does that make sense? As you have this plume going up, and it's just doing like that, and circulating, bringing it drier, cleaner air into the plume, and we actually can quantify that. And you say, well, who cares, it's just a smoke plume. What well, allows us to calculate, if we can figure out the entrainment of this air, then we can actually calculate the buoyancy, and then if we can calculate the buoyancy, then we can figure out how high the plume is going to go, where the smoke is going to go. And the issue right now in climate science is smoke particles in the stratosphere, and how far smoke is going to you know, affect or blow down the end. So sometimes in the southern U.S., we get the smoke from Alaska. It gets real high because it's big fires. Uh, let's see here. One last thing, and then I'll finish up. So this is something that's just been published by my postdoc, uh, Dr. Neil Leroux, and myself. We were out chasing fires, believe it or not, with the truck and the LIDAR, and a lot of the data I showed you was on this trip. This is up near Lassen, near Mount Lassen. And what you see back here is this huge pyrocumulus thing. This thing was just 8,000 meters, so this is like the top of the troposphere. And we were driving back out. And we saw this. Well, the next day, we didn't see much of it. Oh, that's pretty cool. The next day, the whole area was inundated with smoke. And as we drove through the smoke and came out into the clear air, we realized that the smoke had this structure. And so it's what we call smoke-induced density current. So the smoke basically moved like this. And each of these red points is our intercept. So we were on this road, we drove through it. And so we operate the LiDAR while we're driving. It's just pointing vertically. So we're like basically mapping the aerosols as we're driving around the mountains. And as we drove through the smoke, it cleared up. And I'm driving. And I'm like, oh, cool. OK, here, now we can see. And Neil was operating the laptop. And the, 
this we said, wow, this thing's got this crazy structure. It looks like a density kernel. Really? Wow, okay. Turn around, go back through it, turn around, go back through it. Then we stopped and let it come over us, launched a weather balloon through it. And sure enough, it's this density kernel. So what happens is the smoke shades the, air, the surface of the air, just like a cloud would. So the surface gets colder. And so that air is colder. And since it's colder, it's more dense, and it wants to move towards the low pressure, which is the surrounding landscape that's hotter. And so it propagates. It actually moved 25 kilometers against the wind. So it has impacts on for smoke transport, which is a big thing. And when the Forest Service calculates where smoke is going to go for public safety, their models do not count for this. So that's why it's kind of a big deal. Uh, let's see here. So let's see. So here's some time series. You can see the blue dots up here. Watch just the pointer here. The blue dots here are the temperature on the trucks. We're measuring the temperatures we're driving, and then the red dots are warmer temperatures that we measure outside. And it's like a three Kelvin or three Celsius degree difference. And so these are just the points. And what you see is look at the structure in the smoke. This looks like a laboratory tank. So we were driving through here, and it's really dark. It's really shallow, but it has this head on it. Mm -hmm. And that's this entrainment has this smoke that's moving like this. It's just entraining ambient air, so it has what's called a cleft lobe structure to it. Okay, so let's see here. So that's what it looks like. This is optically thick smoke, so we can't really see anything. But what's really cool is it has this like dual layered structure. And they're about a kilometer deep each. The head's about a kilometer wide in width. And if we take all our data, here. So the yellows are wind speeds that are uh, wind profiles the LIDAR can make. The gray, the smoke is the gray shading that you see, so that's the smoke layer. You see all the structure in the top of it, it's shearing off. This wind profile is the weather balloon. So the orange line just kind of highlights what the wind profile looks like in the density current. So it's stronger here than it is up here, and it's actually the opposite direction. So the length of these arrows, so this is, a, this is the arrow, it starts from here to here, and that's, let's say, six meters per second. These are about three meters per second, so it's propagating at one speed against an ambient wind that's double in the magnitude. Well, this is from 1979. This is a picture of what a density current looks like in a fluid tank compared to what we measured in, in, out in the middle of Mount Lawson area. And if you have look at the matching structures, the temperature is the red line, so it is like just by similarity is the density current. So then let's take the next step we did is we calculated the velocity of the front. And we compute 4.7 meters per second. If we take the density that we measured, all these parameters that we measured, and this is from Shane Mayer from uh, uh, CSU Chico. We calculated some things not simple for our Seabreeze fronts. So Seabreeze is a density current. So this is for Seabreeze is Davis. And uh, Seabreeze takes in the Davis. So that, this is his uh, same, same idea. So we used that equation, computed it. That's our observed. And it's uncanny how close it is. So we kind of proved it both by anal analytically and by just uh, so it's pretty cool. Anyways, uh, smoke spread rate can be attributed to the temperature deficit in smoke layer. As simple as that. And so it has impacts for society in transporting smoke. And once we gave a seminar on this to the Forest Service and to kind of the fire weather community, we got some calls this summer from a group that said they saw something happen in Montana where this smoke layer just moved up the valley. And like, I think it's a smoke-induced density current. So people are already seeing it. Okay, I'm going to skip that real quick. This is my last slide. Let's see, do everything else. So, teacher training program, one day workshop at San Jose State. Uh, this was to I'm modifying it as we speak. Uh, sixth grade science or high school science, whatever is requested. I, I'm open to everything. It will seem like Tuesday, everybody is like, oh, high school, make high school. And so, but we proposed sixth grade science standards to incorporate wildfire physics into like thermodynamics. And for California, I think it might be interesting to have some sort of material or lesson on wildfires in terms of weather and maybe even heat transfer processes. This covers three heat transfer processes. 
So, so you said they don't even really know how fire spreads if it's conduction or radiation. Well, you can propose each method because we know that fire, if, it's, if the fuels are laying on each other, it's conduction. Right? And that happens on ground. If it's uh, the convection, I went to talk to this is this is a problem, and so I was on sabbatical last semester and traveled to a couple universities, one in uh, the UK, and we looked at this lab, and they burn stuff in the lab like this, and they radiate it and it ignites. I don't know. So it does transfer by radiation. He's like, yeah. So why is everybody saying it does? He's like, I don't think it does in the field actually. He's like, why? Because if you've got a flame front, it's gas that's moving up. Well, as that gas is moving up from the combustion zone, the wind is pushing that gas. If that, what we call flameless, hit the fuel, it's going to ignite. And so that's one way of transfer. So it's definitely convection. But you have to have, you could preheat the fuels radiatively. And so my colleague that I'm explaining this to, he did some experiments. He's got a video of a tree igniting ahead of the fire front. And what you see, you see pyrolysis, so you see the gases coming out of the water vapor. So here's the flame front, and it's spotting. I've got the video, so I'll show it to you if you have time. But, anyways, and the tree ignites. Because it's, the gases are coming out, there's a little spot, so an ember comes in, boom. And it's like the first time it's been. I've seen it before in Alaska, some videos from Alaska, but it's just crazy. So, convection, radiation, you can use that. I'm developing this over the next six months to get these materials. So San Jose State has a program called BASI, it's their Sciences Institute, where they train teachers, and so I'm going to piggyback on them, and they're going to help me develop the materials from our new research. And then we also go to schools. Uh, we'll go to high schools. I didn't think high school students would think this was cool until everybody's like, oh no, high school students would love this stuff. Yeah, okay,